Good evening, everyone. I'm Colonel Jeremy Bell, the Garrison Commander for Fort Campbell, and welcome to tonight's uh, town hall. Again, COVID-centric uh, town hall. Um, this is this week's current ins installment. I'll uh, start with, as I always do, with just the purpose. And obviously, first and foremost, it's to inform our audience and, and of course, answer all of your questions or as many as we possibly can get to today. Um, I think we're strongest as a community when we exchange information, but I think we're, we're really um, best as a Fort Campbell community when we can help each other and solve problems at the lowest level. And this is a forum to do just that. So I would ask up front, if you think this is useful, um, let people know. Um, and if you're learning something, try to help somebody else out. Um, I'll go over briefly our ground rules for uh, this town hall. I'm going to try to keep it to 60 minutes this time. We also uh, listened to a, a lot of your input uh, last week, and we had a lot of rapid fire comments. So I have a lot of our directors and leaders in back rooms and at home who will respond to your questions uh, immediately um, with some, some very specific answers. I thought first I'd, I'd start this, uh, this town hall with just a baselining of, of where we are. We talked a lot last week about uh, what we were going to do, what we were going to implement. Um, so I'll just give you a baseline of where we are. So currently we're, we're at uh, Charlie, HPCon Charlie, uh, with uh, some Delta measures. Uh, we took a very proactive approach early on, and this helped us out uh, as we were pushing through the, uh, the uh, um, last week's uh, situation. Social distancing is, is obviously our, a, a paramount concern for us, and that's one of the things that we want to um, highlight today, um, it really minimizing the human-to-human -human interaction uh, and contact. Our focus is on mission essential functions, um, and that for us currently is about deployments, readiness, and then installation services and functions that we have to keep up on a daily basis. All non-essential services are, are suspended at this point, uh, we've modified our gate hours as we talked about last week, so all 24-hour gates will remain open, and then all non-24-hour gates are 07 to uh, 1900. And then we've also closed down Mabry and Angel's Gate. Uh, for all food services, we've gone to just pickup and delivery, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that if you want more information. Our Divardi, our division artillery, has uh, taken over um, ownership of the quarantine and isolation facilities here on Fort Campbell. And then our medical facility has reorganized a better posture for uh, the COVID uh, response. We are down to uh, one CDC, Child Development Center, and one school age center here on Fort Campbell. And that's really to service our uh, mission essential um, manning population. One change from last week, uh, or from several weeks ago actually, is our school age centers will now allow um, those children in school to bring their laptop computers with them uh, and they can access their school curriculum uh, through, um, um, through the internet while they're at the uh, school age center. So our method really is about um, taking a whole of Fort Campbell approach to this COVID uh, crisis. And from an individual's perspective, that's, that's about making good decisions. From a unit's per per perspective, that's enforcing safety and social distancing. And then from an installation perspective, it's about maintaining those essential functions and services that we do on a day-to-day -day -day basis. And then from a command's perspective, it's about maximizing information flow and just making good, timely um, decisions. We as a community um, really need to come together and protect ourselves so that we can protect our soldiers, so ultimately our soldiers can protect our nation when called upon. So with that, I'll introduce our, our panel members. To my left is uh, Major General Brian Winsky, the Commanding General for the 101st and the Senior Commander for Fort Campbell. To his left is Division Sergeant Major, um, and uh, that's CSM Barker. We also have in the back room Colonel uh, Patrick Birchfield, who uh, will be answering questions and delivering an opening statement. Uh, he's just not in the, the audience or in the, this uh, studio right now. So, sir, over to you for right. introduction. Well, thanks. Uh, as you said, my name's uh, Major General Brian Winscan, the Commanding General of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault in all of Fort Campbell. And uh, Command Sergeant Major Barker and I wanted to provide you an update this evening uh, where we're at. There have been some developments since our last town hall last week, and uh, the Garrison Commander just highlighted a number of those, and I'll highlight some more as well. 
Uh, first of all, a general update. So there's still no cases with any of the service members, their immediate family, uh, or our civilian workforce on Fort Campbell. That's great news, and what you're doing is helping in that regard and keeping that uh, at zero as long as we possibly can. As you know, there has been three cases uh, that we tested here at Blanchfield that came back positive to our family members of retirees, and the third is a retiree himself. Uh, the great news is uh, they're all recovering at home. Um, they don't require hospitalization or constant medical care. We're checking up on them, of course, and uh, quite confident that, that they're going to fight this thing off. And uh, in a matter of a few days, they'll be uh, good to go. All three were, were related to travel. And again, I'd emphasize uh, the, the importance of the travel restriction that we have on everyone here of 50 miles, staying out of the major metro area of Nashville, where the biggest concentration in our region is. Uh, it's, it's really what's keeping us at, uh, at zero, which is where we want to absolutely stay. Um, again, the key is containing this thing, and uh, you hear that refrain uh, from the national level, certainly the regional level, and it's working for us. And here's some other numbers for you, and you follow this in the news locally, but Tennessee has about 2,200 cases now, positive cases, largely concentrated, as you'd expect, in Nashville and uh, Memphis and some of the other major cities, Chattanooga, et cetera. Kentucky, about 600, largely concentrated in the northern part of the state near uh, Lexington and Louisville. Closer to us, Montgomery County, which includes Clarksville, has 19 cases as of this afternoon, and in Christian County, which includes Hopkinsville and Oak Grove, uh, seven. So the immediate area around us, Stewart County has zero at this point. The immediate area around us, uh, if you look at this on a heat map, is really a moat around Fort Campbell, which is uh, the way we want to keep it. And again, the highest concentration are in the major metro areas. And we have an equally concentrated uh, number of people here that certain areas of Nashville do. But again, what you're doing is effective, and it's keeping our cases uh, to zero. Uh, one big development since last week, uh, in fact, as we conducted this town hall uh, last week on Tuesday evening, we received a, a warning order that our hospital center was going to deploy to help the efforts in New York City. And the next morning we had an advance party in a C-130 and uh, on the ground in New York identifying uh, where we were going to establish the hospital in the Jarvis Center. And then on Thursday we put 300 soldiers from the 531st on aircraft and they arrived in New York Thursday night and have been working diligently, and you've seen this on the national news over the course of the last few days, establishing the hospital center within the Jarvis Center along with another unit like them from Fort Hood and our New York National Guard uh, soldiers that are helping as well. And that thing is ready to start receiving patients. And what they are going to do is serve as a relief valve for the New York medical system and non-COVID cases will come to them, standard emergency rooms, think car accident victims, think uh, people that will go to the emergency room for something other than a COVID issue. Uh, they will come to the 531st and they will provide exceptional care uh, there in this uh, modified uh, hospital set up in the Jarvis Center. And we're quite confident that they're gonna do a great job with that mission. And their motto is to preserve life. That's what's on their unit crest that they wear in their uniform. And they are going to make a huge impact doing exactly that, preserving life to our fellow citizens in New York. Um, there's going to be some adjustments to services at Blanchfield as we prepare for uh, what's inevitably going to be increased numbers of COVID positive cases here in Fort Campbell and our immediate surrounding areas. And, uh, and there's got to be some adjustments based on deploying the 531st for a number of those providers worked in Blanchfield on a day-to-day -day basis. Colonel Birchfield, our hospital commander, is going to talk about that in a moment. But some of the things like dermatology, uh, chiropractor services, podiatry, ophthalmology, and some other specialty non-critical emergency care services, as you would expect, are going to be on hold for a bit as we reorganize the hospital to adjust based on the 531st employment in New York, and then as we adjust to optimize for what we are likely going to have to treat more numbers of COVID uh, individuals requiring hospitalization. So that's a, that's a big development since last week. And uh, again, we couldn't be prouder of uh, the Fort Campbell team and especially the 531st, getting them out the door quickly with all the equipment that they need and uh, getting them established and set up in New York, a phenomenal accomplishment. And, uh, and again, incredibly proud of them and all the folks and their hard work uh, in terms of getting them out in a really tight timeline. 
across Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, you've seen some, uh, some directives from uh, elected leaders at the mayoral level uh, in the case of uh, Clarksville, Oak, Gro Oak Grove, and Hopkinsville, and at the state level in terms of uh, governors, and a lot of directives that are implementing across the state what we've been implementing for really about a week now um, with, with very good effect. You know, some of the fundamental things that we've done with our restaurants on post, having it to go only, same thing with our mess halls, that's now being consistently applied across the states. Um, you know, outdoor activities will still be permissible if so social distancing is adhered to, and that's been our standard as well. PT is the perfect example of that. Um, but again, far more restrictive in terms of the directives that the governors and mayors are are disseminating um, you know, throughout the course of, of, of this week. Um, I mentioned the 531st. Additional elements are also going to be deploying from the 101st and from Fort Campbell in support of the nation's response to uh, COVID. Uh, we have an element that's going to leave tomorrow from the 101st Sustainment Brigade, a transportation unit that is going to also go to New York to help with all things logistics. You know, a large hospital treating large numbers of patients uh, once that's established, the medical care capability is the nucleus of what they do, but it all hinges on logistics and supply, just like everything in the Army. So there's going to be an increased number and a demand on our logistics formations to deploy and support this, uh, this overarching effort. And again, we'll get them out of here in good order. We'll ensure that their families here are taken care of and informed and uh, provide them everything that they need forward to accomplish their mission. Um, reporting. Okay, so I gave you an update on where we're at with regard to cases, and as long as there's no change, I'm going to be able to provide you a, a fundamental no change uh, kind of update. But as you've seen in the news, uh, there's there's directives by from Secretary of Defense on down that for operational security reasons, specific numbers of positive cases and how many soldiers uh, are tested and come back positive on COVID or how many are hospitalized because of it. For obvious reasons related to OPSEC, we don't want to communicate to an adversary or a potential adversary any, uh, anything that they can use to refine their estimate of the situation or convey uh, a potential vulnerability that they may try to take advantage of. So I think everyone can understand that. I will inform all echelon of chain of command uh, what our current numbers are, what our current status is, what current trends are, et cetera, and we'll share with that will share that with you, the public, and the Fort Campbell broader community in general terms, but just be, be understanding that we cannot convey specific numbers from this point forward. And again, we're at zero, which is great. We want to keep it there, but it's likely going to increase. Uh, and the three that we have are, uh, you know, recovering at home and uh, don't require hospitalization. So again, overall, compared to surrounding areas and similar sized installations, we're doing very, very good. And that's all because of what you're doing and it's working and I really want to thank you and I want to hand it off to my Ranger buddy, Command Sergeant Major Barker. Thanks. Hey, sir. Thank you. I, and I think I, I just want to add one thing to that. And, and uh, the important thing with that is, is while we won't be specifically addressing the number of soldiers that are, that are infected, those numbers will still continue to get reported to the, uh, the surrounding communities, wherever that, that soldier resides, whether it be Christian County, Montgomery County, or any of the other uh, uh, neighboring counties around the, the, the Fort Campbell area. Uh, and we will continue to be completely transparent with that. Uh, yeah, last week we, we saw, as uh, General Winsky mentioned, yeah, the nation called and Fort Campbell responded and responded quickly. And that demand is going to continue as, as, this, as things progress throughout, uh, throughout this, this pandemic. Uh, and so what we have to do is be prepared to deliver. Uh, and, and the way we can do that is, is by continuing to keep, keep uh, uh, COVID virus outside the gates of, uh, of Fort Campbell. And the only way we can do that is by all working together to adhere to the, the uh, orders uh, and the, imp the measures we have implemented that to prevent this from, from spreading. Uh, so good order and discipline. How we're going to get after that is, is the formation. We talked about reporting procedures last week, uh, telephonic for, for soldiers to call in, uh, really at the discretion of their chain of command, but also getting eyes on multiple times throughout the week so they can see if there's any signs or symptoms that, uh, that may, may not be getting mentioned in those, uh, in those, those, those telephonic phone calls. So it's important that, that we have those interactions. But again, maintaining social distancing, not bringing in a, a formation at, uh, at, uh, at close intervals to, uh, to pot potentially spread something if there is something that is, is discovered there. Uh, and establishing daily priorities of work. It's again, to maintain this, this readiness, our equipment has to be ready to go, our soldiers need to be ready to go. So there will be things that need to, need, need to, uh, to occur from, from day to day. Uh, you know, one of those, the, the main things is, is fitness, as, uh, as we've mentioned. Uh, and we've 
you, prior to this epidemic, we were able to get, uh, uh, you know, just happened to coincide, we got a bunch of gym equipment in. Uh, and units are making great use of that, providing the sterilization uh, measures to, to be able to, to sterilize that equipment between soldiers using that. Uh, and the staff duties and CQs across the installation are doing a great job of being able to allow that, that equipment. I do want to remind people, though, that uh, we have pulled a lot of the, the, uh, the, uh, ex the duties around the installation uh, to, to reduce the amount of exposure. So there's no road guards out there. So when you're running down the road, uh, if you're doing PT between 6.30 and 8, there is no, no road guards out there to protect you on any what were previously protected routes. So no headphones uh, and uh, you know, run towards, towards traffic along the, sh the shoulder and, and, uh, and yield to the, uh, the traffic uh, and look both ways before crossing the road. Kind of standard standard rules for uh, for everywhere else or any other time that you would be doing doing a PT. Um, you know, it, it's a, a lot. A lot of this falls on on our NCOs. They're carrying a huge burden with this, with with carrying the responsibility for uh, keeping the accountability of our, our soldiers and, and really tending to the, the care and welfare of them and their their families. I know we got a lot of families out there with uh, unique situations. You know, we we have about 43 families. Uh, across the division that got caught in this stop move with uh, their household goods got picked up, uh, their car was shipped overseas, and, and they got stopped dead in their tracks before they could leave Fort Campbell. Uh, we're working with, with, uh, with the gaining installations. We're working through, uh, there is an exception to policy uh, process that, that, that is available to, to you if you are in one of those situations, and I think we processed about five of those today. Uh, and, and we just ask that you continue to, to remain patient with us as we are going through this process. It requires a, a much higher level of uh, consideration uh, to, to be able to approve these things, but we are processing them as soon as they come in. Um, and then along with that as, as well, training. Uh, we mentioned a lot about the, the, the changes in uh, NCOES, uh, distance learning. Next BLC class is gonna be, be starting up here in a, a couple weeks and it will be all distance learning. Uh, we've talked about the, uh, the removing the requirement for NCOES for promotion. For, uh, to staff sergeant and sergeant first class, uh, those measures still remain in effect and, and uh, the uh, NCO academies have put together a, a, a POIs for p to be able to do a distant learning for, for those classes. And I wanna remind everybody, probably most importantly, how we keep this away from us is the social distancing, okay? And really what I need everybody to do is, is to close their circles for those that, that, they, that they, they physically surround themselves with. You know, we can't have large groups of people, but what we also don't want is people interacting with lots of different people. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of cases where you can see, you can trace some of these, these uh, epidemics in other countries down to one person that, uh, you know, went, went to church while ill and infected a bunch of people there who then went on to infect a bunch of other people. Uh, and, and so one person can have a significant negative impact uh, to the readiness and the health of, of, of the organization. And with a disease that's so deadly, we all need to be very cautious of this and take it very seriously. And you know, there's some things that uh, are, it's not very routine for us to have to do a lot of these things. You know, we like to take our kids to the playgrounds, but you have to ask yourself, what am I exposing my children to? Uh, who are the kids that were there that, uh, you know, previously to, to getting there or even the day before? What we found is this virus is very resilient and we need to take all the extra precautions to limit contact with, with, uh, with surfaces that have not been been sanitized. Uh, you know, using the trail systems and, and roads getting out there and hiking and, and uh, walking, running, biking, those are all great activities as long as you're, you're keeping your distance from uh, folks that you're with. But uh, you know, we, we got to put an end to the, the backyard barbecues and, and the, uh, the garage parties that we've, we've had uh, some reports of across the installation. And I ask you to enforce that amongst your neighbors. All right, We're all part of this community here and we all play an important role in it. Uh, and if a, a courteous reminder doesn't get the job done, uh, feel free to contact the uh, the military police and we'll send somebody out there to uh, to address it. Um, and again, communication and, and open dialogue is, is, is very important as we go through this. You know, we've got a lot of great responses for uh, concerns through, uh, through through Facebook, you know, the medium we're using to conduct this, this town hall tonight, uh, emails, phone calls. Those are all very effective and uh, appreciate the feedback. But most importantly, I ask that you use a chain of command. That is the most effective and quickest way to, uh, to, to get the results we're, we're looking for uh, is, is solving a lot of these issues at the lowest level uh, so that uh, you know, we, we don't bind things up at the, at, at the upper levels where we're you know, trying to review these ETPs for uh, these soldiers that are in very, very uh, difficult situations. We wanna make sure we can give them the prompt attention. Uh, and then again, again 
uh, you know, keep in contact with each other through, through these, these, uh, these digital means. Uh, this is a, you know, very, uh, being isolated like this is, it, this is gonna go on for, for a while. We're not, we're just in the very beginning of this right now. And this is gonna have, you know, some psychological effects on, on, on people. Uh, and, and you need to be able to have people you can connect with through, whether it's, uh, you know, any of the, the mediums I discussed with Facebook, phone calls, uh, you know, get, get, to, get to know each other digitally is, is what I'd ask, but, uh, you know, minimize those, those in-contact gatherings. But I'll turn it back over to you, sir. All right, um, so we'll turn it over to Patrick Birchfield uh, for a, a medical update. I, I think he's gonna answer a, a lot of your questions. There's a bunch of questions on the medical side already. So over to you, Patrick. Hey, thanks a lot. In the interest of uh, social distancing, I'm off in a remote location <laughs> uh, to be safe from everybody and have the proper social distance. Um, I do wanna uh, give some Bach updates. There have been a lot of changes that have gone on, but the first thing I need to do is say thank you to our Bach family. Uh, they've made a tremendous effort to, uh, to create an infectious disease hospital with a realistic and comprehensive pandemic plan, something that Fort Campbell has never had before in the past. You should really be very proud of your hospital. So again, with regard to those positives last week that we had, I, I need to emphasize that the system worked really well as intended. Folks came on to the post, they first they called ahead, they felt ill, they called ahead, they came onto the post, they drove in, the system worked well, uh, they uh, never got out of their car, they went through the drive-through, uh, they were examined, they were tested, they moved off to their homes of residence, and they never actually stepped foot on Fort Campbell during that time. So the system worked exactly as we intended it to work. Uh, so well done there. Uh, so the folks that we test, I know that the tests are taking a, a long time and I'll address that in just a second, but the folks that we test, we're gonna call them back every couple of days. We are calling them back every couple of days just to make sure that they're, they're doing well and, they're, and they don't need to see any further uh, medical care and the reason we do that is because it's the right thing to do but also we want to keep track of folks uh, anybody that tests positive we're doing the same thing for them we're calling them back every couple of days and making sure that they're doing okay what you need to consider though is that we've had a couple people uh, under 10 but several people that were hospitalized for respiratory systems that we thought looked a lot like the COVID-19 disease it wasn't these folks just had flu, but the point there is that you can be really sick and not have COVID, and you can be, ha and you can have COVID and not really be that sick. So it turns out you need to <clears throat> justify how you come and go in the hospital with regard to your own your your own symptoms. So if you're sick, come into the hospital, call ahead with if you have respiratory symptoms. If you're not doing too badly, if you're doing okay, then stay at home. If that makes any sense. So uh, we do have a new visitors policy as we've, we, as we've moved towards a more COVID oriented hospital and I, I want to highlight that for you but the first thing I need to say is that it's to protect patients and staff. There are people that are going to be inconvenienced and we know that and we understand that but in the end the right thing to do is to protect our patients and our staff and, and so if you're coming in for an outpatient visit, we ask that you, you don't bring any, anybody with you unless the patient is a child, then you can bring a patient. Or if someone's elderly or disabled and they need some help, obviously they can bring someone with them. But in general, we're trying to really discourage people that don't need to be in the hospital from being in the hospital. And the same thing for inpatient. Uh, our visiting hours are decreased now. They're from 10 to noon and from 6 to p.m. And we want to limit uh, to one visitor. We know that a, a spouse may want to be there with a delivering mom, but we want to deliver. Uh, we want to limit to one visitor, and we want to have that person not be over the age of 65 or or be young, uh, less than 18. And think about it. Those are some high-risk groups that we're trying to protect. So that's the reason for that understand that families you know it's a joyous time for folks uh, and that families want to participate but these are extraordinary times and that we ask that you help protect our staff and and, and yourselves by adhering to our, our new uh, visitors policy 
Another change is that the active duty behavioral health has moved. It's on 21st Street for in buildings 2436 and 2437. And as much and in, in, in conjunction with the other care that we're offering, pretty much anything that we can do via telehealth, the, the phone, uh, we're going to try to continue to do that. And we're only going to do face-to-face -face care if uh, if emergent or walk-in or, or a confirmed scheduled appointment. If the provider has talked to you over the phone and they say, I really kind of need to see you, then they're going to do that too. And, and FAP, FAP services are going to conduct theirs uh, in a similar fashion. Another change, we talked about this last time, is that the C entrance, that's the entrance near the emergency center or near the, uh, the coffee shop there, that's closed. And if you'll recall when I talked about this last week, it's so that we can have only COVID-related care coming into that side of the building, either through the emergency center or through the COVID clinic. Um, there, the emergency center is going to defer COVID-related illnesses or like illnesses to that clinic and try to remain clean, but they are open for emergency services. Anybody that's coming in for any other services need to come in through the A entrance. That's the other side of the hospital. And the idea there, hopefully, is obvious. We're trying to keep those two populations separate. Another change is that physical therapy has moved out of the hospital. If you're getting physical therapy services, uh, they'll be at Bird Clinic or the Point Clinic. And as you'll recall, all of our family-oriented medicine went to the Bird, and all of our soldier-oriented medicine went to the Point or TMC5. Similarly, the main hospital pharmacy, that's going to be only for the inpatient services. So as we get uh, potentially sicker patients, we're going to devote that pharmacy service inside the hospital only for those patients that are inside the hospital. The town center pharmacy is going to remain the, the main uh, pharmacy for individuals who um, are, are a retired population. And if you've gotten your outpatient care at a different clinic like Bird or La Point, you can use those pharmacies there to pick up your, your prescriptions. Uh, admissions and dispositions, that's if you're going to come into the hospital uh, to be an inpatient, for instance, if you're delivering a baby. That's going to also move away from the C entrance. It's now near the A entrance on, on the first floor. It's near patient records. And similarly, you know, nothing has changed. If you have uh, COVID-19 related symptoms or signs, call that 1-800-TRICARE number, option one, or you can do, that's the nurse advice line, or that you can call our triage phone line directly using the, uh, the appointment line. That's gonna be available 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's seven days a week. The 531st left, of course, many of those providers are uh, MTOSI providers, in other words, they uh, work their day jobs at Blanchfield Army Community Hospital. So what does that mean for us? Well, in a good way and in a bad way, we had, here, that's that, is that better? It both is a good thing and as a bad thing, we had uh, an er emergency deployment readiness exercise earlier in the year, and that helped us determine the kinds of things that we needed to do to shift our patient load away from those kinds of providers that the 531st relies on. So based on that and based on our um, exqu exquisite planning team and our operations and our medical people, our, our clinicians all got together and they looked at our, our plans and, and our resources and, and came up with their plan. So we essentially have very, very little impact with the 531st deployment. We'd rather have them here at home with us, helping and augmenting and making us a little bit better, but we should be okay. Some people had a lot of questions about the town center pharmacy, uh, the wait process there. And I'll tell you this, that, um, that the process actually works really well. Now, if you go the first thing in the morning, that first hour or two, you're likely to experience a wait. And that is uh, understandably a little bit annoying to folks. But what we found is that the last couple of hours of the day, it's, it's not very crowded at all. So the absolute best way to do this, now as you recall, we mandated that everybody drop off their prescriptions. So that minimizes the amount of time that you're into the pharmacy. That minimizes the amount of time that you're interacting with a, a pharmacy teller or some, that person at the window. 
and it also allows us to put extra people in the back filling prescriptions. So you've minimized the amount of time you're in there. You've min you've maximized the people that are in the back, kind of doing that back door, uh, that back office work. And then if you come back at least two hours later, it's generally a very quick process, less than 15 minutes to receive your prescription. And you can certainly come back the next day. We'll hold that prescription for you for 14 days. So the best thing, Saturdays are, are hit and miss. This Saturday was, was really quite empty after that first hour or two. So uh, the, if I was going to tell you how to kind of game play that, that town center pharmacy, I would tell you to come in at that last hour or two uh, before 6 o'clock, drop off your prescription, then come back the next day or the next in the next week or two at that same time, and you're going to find your, your best bet there, getting in and out quickly and minimizing the exposure of yourself to other people. Another good option for that is that TRICARE home delivery. So here's a way for you to get your, your prescriptions emailed, or not emailed, uh, that'd be nice, but mailed directly to your home. Uh, there's a little bit of copay with that, but you get a 90-day supply just like you do inside of, the, uh, inside of the MTF or in the town center pharmacy, and of course, uh, it goes right to your home. Other options are uh, if you're an active duty soldier, not go to the town center pharmacy, you can go to that LaPointe. And, uh, and take those time windows that I just mentioned before. Another uh, thing that's on a lot of people's minds is the lab. Um, how, how come there's so many tests? How come the lab tests are taking a little bit longer than we want them to? And those, those are actually related, right? So everybody in the country right now wants to get their lab test. And, uh, and of course, supply. there's a limited supply and there's a large demand, so we're, we're kind of stretching out that resource. It's just like an industrial base. As it, as it builds up before you know, a time of war, it takes some time to ramp up. And the testing uh, capacity of, of the country and it's with this new and novel test is, is the exact same way. So the capacity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the, uh, the wait times, the return times are coming and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's probably not a, much of a comfort to you if you're waiting on your own test. But I'll say, in the end, the test doesn't matter. We want to know, uh, but we're going to treat you uh, symptomatically if you have the, the virus. We're going to treat you symptomatically if you don't have the virus, if you have it and you're doing well, you can be at home and recover at home. If you don't have it and you're, and you're not doing well and you need to come in, uh, then that doesn't change either with the result of your test, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, I, I know, like I said, it's a peace of mind thing and people want to know, but just realize that in the end, we're going to take care of you based on your symptoms and, and how you're feeling, not based on the, whether the test result is positive or negative. And, and speaking of which, so suppose that you're feeling sick uh, and, and you want to know whether or not it's safe to, to come to work. And I would, again, ask you to think of this like the cold or flu. There's some very specific CDC guidance that I'm about to share with you. But consider that it's not COVID, right, which is new and novel. And because of that, it's, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people to think of. Consider it like the flu, which we're familiar with. Uh, we, we all deal with every single year, right? So it's also a virus, it's transmitted the exact same way. So even though it's not the flu, think of it like the flu. If you had the flu and you had a fever, you wouldn't come to work. So the same thing applies with COVID. Uh, if, if you had a cold and you, and you were uncomfortable and you were sneezing all the time, hopefully you wouldn't come to work either. So the guidance is this. If you're sick, whether it's COVID or not COVID, you wanna stay at home. All right, stay at home and quarantine yourself. You need to stay at home until you've been afebrile, meaning you do not have a fever for at least three days. So no fever for at least three days, and that means without medication. So if you take Tylenol to, to bring your fever down, that doesn't count. You have to have no fever for three days with no medication. Your respiratory symptoms have to be getting better, and you have to have had at least seven days since your symptoms began. So seven days since your symptoms began, three days without fever, no medicine, and your respiratory symptoms have to be getting better. And the reason I say that is because a lot of people seem to have a residual bronchospasm, which, which is a way of saying you're gonna have a dry cough and you're not, uh, you're not contagious anymore. So 
that's expected. We know that people are going to have that, but three days, no fever, without medication, at least seven days since the symptoms began, and then your respiratory symptoms have gotten better. And if you meet those three things, then you could consider going back to work. Those are kind of the thresholds that the CDC has put out. So that's basically I want, all I wanted to cover in my open statements. I uh, appreciate the time and, and back to you, Jeremy. All right, thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> so we're getting some complaints about uh, volume. So if you could bring your microphones a little bit closer and then just talk a little bit louder. Um, so I'll throw my first question over to you, sir. Um, and it's from Faven. And what she wants to know is the uh, local stop, move, and shelter in place um, orders from Clarksville and Montgomery County. How is that going to affect Fort Campbell? Yeah, what, uh, what is exempted in that is essential activity for government and military. So, uh, you know, we consider uh, what, what the Command Sergeant Major, uh, what Command Sergeant Major Barker was talking about uh, up front, you know, the accountability every other day. Uh, where soldiers come in and their uh, NCO gets eyes on them with ideally a medic as well, uh, you know, transiting to and from the installation, that'll be permissible. Um, there are some specifics, and I don't have them with me, uh, but I know in general terms you're allowed to go to and from a medical facility. You're allowed to go uh, to get uh, sustenance, uh, food to the grocery store, or come on post to the commissary. Um, you're allowed to use outdoor spaces and parks, but not the jungle gyms, the play areas, uh, you know, think the green way, you know, you can go for a family walk there as long as you maintain social distancing, uh, but not use the playground uh, apparatus and things of that nature. Um, so again, sustenance, uh, you know, the fundamental things you need, uh, gas for your car, et cetera. And, uh, and then the occasions where the soldiers are gonna come in for uh, either PT or accountability, not formations, um, you know, that's all essential activity as well. Excellent. So I'll, from an installation's perspective, what I'll say is that the installation is not closed down. We have not restricted access. Uh, everyone who has had access before will continue to have access. Um, and we don't see that changing in the foreseeable future, but um, that is a, a potentiality if, if things change on the ground. Uh, for you, CSM, um, Donna has asked if, uh, if you could explain a little bit about how we went through determining who was mission essential uh, personnel for Fort Campbell? Well, Donna, that's a, a great question, and, and really that's not a, a quite, uh, something that we reserve up at the division command level uh, for, for the most part. Really, that's the subordinate commanders. You know, they do an assessment of, of what they need to accomplish the missions that are tasked from the division, from the brigades, and so on down. Uh, and they determine what is necessary to, uh, to accomplish their mission and the personnel that are required to, uh, to do those things. And so it varies from formation to formation, but just like missions from formation to formation uh, vary. I'd, uh, let me share some examples on that because folks can go from mission essential uh, to a posture where they're not required to physically come in every single day. And a great example of that is all the folks that supported pushing out the 531st last week. You know, our installation transportation office, if there's not a unit coming or going, um, those folks generally will not have to come in physically to work. But of course, as we're pushing out 300 soldiers and uh, 60 truckloads of equipment, uh, we needed those folks to coordinate all that, synchronize it all, get it uploaded, get it pushed out. And now that we have a little bit of a lull, uh, I'd imagine they're not physically required to come in, but that's going to pick back up as we push more units out. Um, for our maintainers, you know, if we have a critical piece of equipment, uh, an aircraft or something of that nature that we have the part for that we need to get up, if we can do that without, uh, you know, uh, a large concentration of forces to do it, our aviation brigade deploys this June, and uh, we have to get uh, those aircraft uh, up and running in certain circumstances. So again, maintainers may need to come in uh, to accomplish that mission and then go home. A lot of folks uh, immediately think to the essential, non-essential personnel when we have a bad weather day, which is right. generally short duration, one or two days in length. And uh, there, generally everyone we want to stay home uh, or absolutely minimize those that need to come in because of the fundamental safety of transiting on the roads. Um, like those types of days, our emergency services folks are essential, our, our uh, fire department, our MPs, our law enforcement, uh, the folks that run the fundamental utilities of the installation. Um, you know, all told, it's generally about 10% of the population that falls into that category of essential and required to physically be in every single day. And again, we're trying to balance it, and it is going to ebb and flow, and some folks will be essential and required to be here one day and uh, not the next. And 
We expect this to go for, uh, you know, weeks, if not potentially, uh, you know, a matter of months. So we'll, uh, again, try to get out as clear instructions as we can, uh, but it is going to move back and forth each day that goes by. Absolutely. Um, so you bring up a couple good points. So um, one, I would just highlight that you have a, a tremendous civilian workforce and, and military workforce on this installation, uh, and they come to work each and every day to maintain these essential services. Um, and a lot of them have volunteered um, to, to come in uh, and, and be the mission essential workforce. So uh, hats off to everybody um, that, that is mission essential, that is doing the, the daily work. We'll do our part uh, to try to work in shifts so that we kind of spread the wealth a little bit. Um, but you also brought up that it's mission dependent. And so we have a, a couple different bins of folks that, that work on the installation. You have contractors, uh, you have the civilian workforce, you have the military workforce. And what I'll tell folks is um, it's, it's more important that you stay in touch with your immediate supervisors and get guidance from them because your status may change like the CG said day to day. Um, so make sure that you're tied in very closely with, uh, with your, your uh, supervisors and your chain of command. Um, CSM, if you could, uh, Patricia is asking, how do we protect those that are identified as mission essential? So one, we've identified that they're important so we, they need to be here to do the work that we're asking them to do. So they're, they're different in that regard, um, but then we're also putting them in, in danger and that, that's kind of a, um, a, a push and pull. So how do we protect them? Right, and, and uh, that, that, that is a, the, the big, big challenge we have here. You know, it's always a, a matter of uh, managing risk, you know, and, and again, that's what, uh, what commanders get, uh, get paid to do and that's where they assume the, uh, the responsibilities to, to weigh the, the, the risk uh, to the force as well as the risk to the mission when they're making these decisions uh, who is who is mission essential uh, but again we're doing the the uh, the social distancing measures as best we can you know some 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 environments are a little more confined than others and in those situations uh, taking the extra precautions of more frequent cleaning uh, more frequent health health checks on the, uh, the, the the personnel that are coming in and really if we can we can offset the the shifts of that people come and went coming in, doing multiple shifts throughout the day, uh, minimizing the exposure, again, closing those circles so they're not exposed to multiple groups of right. people throughout the day, so that if, if we do get uh, get a case within uh, one of those mission essential personnel, we can isolate it much more better and it doesn't spread to the, the rest of the mission essential force. Uh, and also make maximizing the use of, of uh, VTCs, uh, teleconferences, and those things that you don't have to have that physical presence that uh, causes an increased risk of exposure. You know, like I said, the emergency services at SAR Major just uh, hit on something of how we're protecting our workforce and, and uh, Colonel Birchfield talked about the Blanchfield team. That's obviously, uh, you know, all essential, uh, absolutely mission essential personnel up there. And, uh, you know, in some cases working in very close confines, that is why we have a lot of the rigid measures that we've emplaced and a lot of the restrictions in terms of how you can enter and exit the hospital and a lot of the restrictions on the number of visitors that we can have there to protect our workforce. So uh, when it's time for all hands and we have significant numbers of individuals that we're needing to treat, that workforce is, is there and ready for it. Um, so our, our top priority is protecting, protecting folks, but there are essential things that need to happen and uh, you know we talked about a bunch of those, but there's there's a number of others as well. Yes, sir. Uh, so what's on Corey's mind is um, you talked about this being a long duration um, situation. So w when do you reassess the current posture? Yeah. Um, and what are some of those factors that you take into account as the senior commander um, to fully posture us for? Sure. You? Great question. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a daily assessment. Um, you know, we look at a lot of data, we get a lot of advice from our medical professionals, from the division surgeon, Colonel Thompson, from our hospital commander, Colonel Birchfield, from you and your team. Um, you know, when we weigh all that, we look at all the measures that are in place and as, you know, make a determination if we need to implement more, uh, if we see changes in the conditions or data that warrant it, uh, or if we're overly restrictive in some areas and uh, there may be room to loosen things up, uh, especially as we look at this over the long term. So, uh, you know, a daily assessment from the senior leadership uh, advised by the senior medical leadership, uh, the senior leadership in the installation, all the commanders, any significant decision that we make, the uh, brigade level uh, commands, commanders and command sergeants major are part of that process. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, you know, we assess it cyclically as well and kind of formally 
on about a weekly basis. As an example, uh, you know, next week we're going to make another assessment as to how far out uh, we're going to push the time window for how long we'll be in health protection condition, Charlie, with certain Delta measures uh, imposed. So uh, long answer that didn't directly answer it. It's a, a daily, uh, weekly, Absolutely. and constant and cyclic assessment the most important thing i'd emphasize with it is it's uh you know it's not just me and command sergeant major barker uh, as we do pt in the morning figure out what we're going to implement you know it's advised by uh and with the input of all the commanders sergeants major our medical professionals and and whatever it is the expert in that uh in that field that we're implementing a measure on yeah absolutely a anything to add csm I yes sir so that you know we're what we can't afford is, uh, you know, we have, have a train running down the tracks at us right now. Uh, and, you know, if we're reactive, we, w we wait till the train hits us. Uh, so we're going to be a little bit overreactive, and we're going to get off the tracks before, before the train even gets near us uh, in order to be proactive and, and prevent these things from happening. So that's why, we, you know, we got a lot of pushback when we closed down the gyms, told people to stop playing basketball, uh, put restrictions on visitors coming on the installation, shut down, you know, hunting season right when turkey, uh, turkey season opened. Uh, golf. Those are a lot of, of proactive measures that can be seen as overreactive uh, because the, it, it, it's not here yet. Uh, but by taking these measures, we can prevent prevent it from ever ever getting here or delaying the impact when it does finally get here. Spot on. And I think you bring up a good point there. It's not just like golf can be a very individual game, right? You can social distance very well um, when you're playing golf, but you're also inviting the population onto Fort Campbell, which is something that we don't want to encourage either. We want people to stay at home. We want them to um, shelter in place, if you will. So um, food service seems to be on folks' minds. So maybe I'll, I'll address that up front and then uh, sort of, or CSM, if you have something uh, to add. So for food service, we tried to keep as many food service um, facilities open as we could. And the senior com commander made that decision because he wants soldiers to have as many options as possible. And our population that lives on, on this installation, we have 4,400 homes uh, and, and families live in each one. So um, it, it can get kind of bland if you're just eating in the mess hall day in and day out. So we did try to keep as many open as possible. AFES has been a great partner in this regard. Uh, they've kept a, as many of their uh, facilities open and they've, they've changed how they uh, serve our, our uh, population. So very much uh, drive-through is their focus, but they've also established uh, drop-off locations. So you can call ahead uh, and park in a specific area of uh, the AFI's main exchange, and they will bring the food out to you. Uh, we tried to keep as many MWR facilities open as possible as well, um, but we're really down to uh, Coal Park Commons and the, the Hooper Bowling Alley. Um, just because of staffing, we couldn't keep all of them open. Um, and, and that's been pretty successful. Uh, they have a pretty diverse menu, mm -hmm. and uh, all soldiers need to do is, is call and uh, place an order, and we do, the MWR does delivery as well as pickup. So uh, we do try to protect our, our workforce um, that, is, that are providing this service, and that's through minimizing social uh, contact, um, and that's why everything's gone to pickup or uh, drive-through. So if you have anything yeah to I'd encourage everyone to uh, to use that you know not you know, a lot of folks don't necessarily know what's available and again it's a good variety it's good quality food and uh, and uh, you know it's a great service that yes, that our team uh, continues to provide here um, additionally all the mess halls you know no one's eating in the mess halls uh, but the to-go uh, chow is available in the dining facility out in uh, the aviation brigade footprint the dining facility that uh, the sustainment brigade and third brigade share in the Snipes Dining Facility and 1st Brigade's footprint, and there's a lot of other units in that immediate area. And then the 2nd Brigade Dining Facility supports both the Aviation, uh, or I'm sorry, 2nd Brigade and the uh, the Devardi, uh soldiers in their footprint. So the, the chow halls are open, uh, available for grab and go. It's uh, a quick process to get a good, good meal and, uh, again, utilize it. Excellent. Anything CSM? No, just on the uh, kind of on the food food thing, you know, a lot of there's been a lot of comments about the the commissary as, as well. Right. Uh, and you know, as we go through this this period, I, I would ask that uh, you know, when you're shopping at the commissary, you know, really only one one person needs to go. You know, don't don't bring uh, your spouse or uh, don't bring your kids. Uh, don't take any unnecessary 
uh, measures that, that you have to to potentially uh, uh, expose somebody to, to, to somebody that could have, even if it's just the flu. Um, so, and it also puts more of a burden on the, uh, on the workers in there and extends the, the, the wait times there. You know, so make a list, uh, go there once a week and, uh, and get what you need and, and, uh, and get on out. Excellent. So continuing on that theme of uh, MWR, CYS, uh, Child and Youth Services, is, is, has come up as a question again. And uh, we asked, and, and uh, uh, our MWR chain has granted the ability for us to uh, give refunds if you're not enrolled in or if you're not uh, actively using your slot uh, in CYS. Um, so that will continue for the duration. This is not something that was temporary. You also will not lose your slot um, since we have closed down all but one CDC and, and school age center. So uh, no worries there. You're not going to lose your slot, and you will get your money back if you paid into it. Um, let's see. How about uh, lots of questions. This one's from Maddie, and maybe this one over to UCSM. Um, playgrounds are, are coming up. Um, that's a congregating area for kids, and it attracts like a magnet. Uh, a, a bunch of kids at a time. So how are we enforcing keeping people off the playground um, and in those community areas? That, well, that's a great point. You know, and it, what I'd ask is that everybody has a role in this and in, in enforcing this. And if you see somebody out there, uh, you know, one of your neighbors or somebody from another community that's that's visiting, just, just remind them, let them know that uh, they need to stay off the, off the playground equipment. And, and again, if that doesn't work, you can uh, do an escalation, call the, call the MPs and notify uh, units chain of command. Uh, and we can get somebody out there to uh, to uh, to get them off the equipment and pr Absolutely. protect them, really, for their own safety. Yeah, I think it's important for everybody to make good decisions. This mm -hmm. is about not just protecting you or your children, but protecting the community that we're a part of. And if we each make good decisions each and every day, um, then we're going to be in a good position. And like the CG pointed out, we are making good decisions. Um, we've kept um, a, the disease at bay as, as best as we possibly can. Um, sir, anything to add on just the social distancing and kind of personal responsibility? Well, let's just collectively police ourselves. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to post folks, uh, you know, at places like that. Um, the Sergeant Major and I patrol uh, over the course of the weekend, every weekend, and haven't seen much of it. Again, I think we're, we're policing ourselves very well. Everyone's, uh, you know, mature decision making is being applied to everything that we do. Uh, as time goes by, uh, the temptation uh, you know, to, to let off some steam while you're cooped up in the house and stuff is going to grow and grow. But the key to success for this disease is keeping it contained and preventing proliferation and spread. Um, if we keep it from doing that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to mass our medical capability on it as it grows and, uh, and keep it really, really at bay. So that's uh, the key to success. Excellent, sir. Uh, this one will be over to uh, Patrick. So um, visitors at the, the hospital, that, that, that was a change for you. You addressed that, but there's some specific concerns about pregnancies and, and when um, folks have children, they want to bring their family. So what's your policy and how are you addressing that at Bach? So again, with the outpatient visits, if you're an adult and you're coming for your own uh, health care, we would ask that you don't bring anybody. Kind of similar to what the Command Sergeant Major said with regard to, to going to the commissary. Uh, if you can avoid bringing anybody at all, that's what we really need you to do. Understand that uh, that isn't uh, always an option. So I would actually look to FRGs or some other uh, social support networks, uh, even neighbors, even though we're trying to engage in social distancing, I think it's probably still the, the wiser choice to, to leave your child, if you can, if it happens to be a child, with a, a low-risk neighbor or friend or supporter from the FRG for an hour or two, rather, rather than to risk bringing someone unnecessarily into the hospital, uh, because that's where eventually sick people are going to come, and so we want to avoid contamination. It's really the best practice to, uh, for everyone's protection to avoid uh, guests as much as, as we can, people that aren't necessary, people that are not the patients. Thanks, Patrick. DODIA seems to be uh, another uh, item of discussion on, uh, on Facebook right now. So maybe I'll just talk real quickly. DODIA has decided to make uh, their announcements weekly. So they will announce this week 
um, when, when school is closed for next week. And you can expect those uh, announcements to come either Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, they'll try to give you as much advance wa warning um, and, and push that information out as, as soon as possible. Um, they're also providing uh, food for uh, all of their students 18 and under. Um, that will continue for the duration as well. So uh, Dodia heard your, your calls earlier on. This is about two weeks ago and they put that program uh, in place. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about our connection with the community. So you, you very much try to keep aligned with our local partners and, and what they do. Um, how is that communication working and, and um, where do we collaborate? Yeah, you know, so our Department of Emergency Services collaborates with their counterparts, our, uh, our hospital uh, team and the surrounding uh, hospitals, uh, Tanova, et cetera, uh, have a very good relationship. Uh, in fact, over the course of the last several months, I've been to a few events where we've had the leadership of our, our off-post uh, you know, providers and hospitals uh, linked up here at Blanchfield um, to, again, talk through things like this, how we would mutually support each other in the time of uh, significant need, um, et cetera. So it's a, it's a daily uh, communication. Um, you know, I'm communicating with the mayors of both the cities, uh, or all three of the cities and, uh, and both counties uh, on about a weekly basis. Um, you know, we keep each other apprised of major decisions that we make. When we make a decision that does have an impact or relates to uh, off post, in the case of an on post decision or vice versa, if a county or city is making a decision that they know is gonna impact a lot of service members, uh, you know, we talk about it before that decision is made and uh, the, the most recent, uh, you know, additional restrictions on movement, et cetera, uh, were all made in close coordination and, uh, and with the advice of the, the experts uh, related to whatever that decision is going to be. Yeah, I, I truly appreciate our relationship here at Fort Campbell with our surrounding communities. It's, it's probably one of the best in, in the country. Um, and certainly when we're in a crisis like this, that, that plays in our, our favor for sure. Um, anything to add, CSM? I have one question for you. Um, so, when we are talking, I'm just trying to. Um, all right. So, folks in the in the barracks are they considered high risk individuals, uh, and what are we doing uh, to help protect them? So, you have two different populations. Maybe we can talk about is the quarantine population, and then the general population not in quarantine. Yeah, so I think the uh, the risk uh, the risk we have with the barracks is uh, we have a, a you know a lot of of our forces that, that live in the barracks that are in close proximity to right. each other, and so the risk the risk we have uh, that's elevated with the barracks is that if, if we get the contagion in the facility, it, it's much more apt to spread and have a much greater effect than if it I, than if it uh, if one of our soldiers that lives off post or in uh, in private privatized family housing on post. Uh, if they get infected, it's much less likely to spread uh, across the neighborhood just because of physical barriers in the distance and really the measures that we put in place with uh, with social distancing that that naturally exist in uh, in uh, individual quarters. So that that is why one of the main reasons why it's it's uh, we have to. Uh, it, it might seem unfair in some regards the the, the way that it is for for the soldiers in the barracks um, because it, they they are in that closer proximity and they are much more vulnerable uh, and, and we have to be uh, much more vigilant with uh, with making sure that we protect them. Good. Uh, and we're coming up on an hour. Um, one of the questions that kind of touches a lot of different topics is family care plans. So we have folks still deploying. We have obviously 3rd Brigade uh, doing their mission on the Southwest Border Mission. Um, family care plans do come into to play uh, when folks are planning for these types mm -hmm. of contingencies and deployments. What's your guidance to the force on family care plans? When to use them? Yeah, uh, you know, w w what we don't want is, uh, you know, an early initiation of a family care plan where perhaps it's grandparents or somebody that would take care of the children and we're having them move, potentially exposing them to something that didn't exist where they were. Uh, so mature decision making is what's, uh, what's the key here. Um, you know, if we have dual military uh, parents, as an example, you know, if we can coordinate, which is what we want to do between the units to where we balance the requirements to be physically at work 
um, or physically at home. Again, the preponderance of the force and the preponderance of uh, our soldiers are generally place of duty at home, quarters, billets, etc. cetera, uh, right now. But in circumstances where they both have to, uh, that's why we kept the one child development center and school age uh, center uh, open for essential personnel if they need to use that for, uh, for child care without having to activate a family care plan, et cetera. Uh, but if we had a dual military family that deploys or deployed already um, and they need to activate that, this is certainly why uh, we go through exhaustive review of those things to make sure everything's in place that when the time comes or if the time comes to deploy, they're able to, to implement it. So there's no cut set answer in these conditions uh, as to when it's required to activate the family care plan other than both uh, in the case of dual military, both are deploying. Um, and again, we just appeal to uh, individuals and uh, the unit chain of command to apply mature decision making here and uh, try to balance it as best we can. And I think now that we're generally in the essential personnel mode, HP Con Charlie Plus, uh, you know, most folks place of duty uh, is such that they'd be able to care for their, their uh, children during right. the course of, course of a day. Great. Um, so we're, we're right at the hour mark, um, and we are getting quite a few uh, repeat questions. So what I'll, I'll, I'll just say in closing and then uh, turn it over the, the CG and CSM for closing remarks is that we've had a lot of great questions. Um, your, your dialogue has been exceptional. You bring up a lot of great points. Uh, like I said earlier in, in this broadcast, we absolutely tried to get as many folks to surge on this Facebook town hall to answer your questions as you were posting them. So I hope that that helped everybody and we'll continue to do that over the rest of this week to make sure we answer each and every one of your questions. That is important to us because these are important issues to you. Um, and with that, sir, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, hats off to everyone, our, our soldiers, um, their families, our civilian workforce, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, our folks that are continuing to keep Fort Campbell safe and secure every single day, keep Fort Campbell operating every single day, uh, our, our Blanchfield and our, our entire medical community and Blanchfield uh, Hospital and our medical professionals and all that they do, um, you know, our hats are just off to all of those folks. And nothing really brings teams together like a challenging mission, challenging set of circumstances, and this is challenging. And our most challenging days with this are ahead of us. So it is critically important that just as you've done over the last two to three weeks or so, um, you know, adhere to these provisions that are implemented to accomplish what we must accomplish, which was to slow the proliferation of this thing. That is the key. Uh, so it keeps it manageable for our medical professionals and our medical capacity. And that's how we'll ultimately beat this thing, which we will. We will ultimately beat this thing. Uh, but it's going to be a tough task and set of tasks and a tough mission to do so. But we got the right team to do it. And I, uh, I'm absolutely confident that, uh, you know, we're going to beat it and uh, we'll be stronger in the end because of it. So thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, sir. CSM, anything in closing? Yes, sir. So first of all, I'd like to, to echo uh, General Winsky's comments that there's no team I'd rather be on. Uh, as, as we go through this uh, this, this uh, challenge that's ahead of us right now. Uh, but I also want to, uh, you know, acknowledge that, uh, you know, we, we reached 101 uh, traffic uh, fatality-free days uh, across uh, Fort Campbell. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're going to take this Friday as a, as a Donza in recognition of that. But I want to remind everybody out there that, uh, you know, we've we got to keep this trend going. It doesn't stop at 101 days. I want to continue th this uh, uh, further and, and not have another fatality on, on, a, on a roadways that's uh, unnecessary. Uh, so, you know, driving safety, you know, people should be driving uh, a whole lot other than to those essential things. You know, really staying put is, is the, the key to uh, defeating this. Um, uh, but uh, I know as the, the, war the weather warms up, you know, the motorcycles are going to start coming out. Uh, but it's, it's important that people make sure that their, their motorcycles in good, safe riding conditions before taking it out. Uh, and throwing a leg over it, be, be cautious of the debris on the roadway, and just all those general things that uh, you, you kind of kind of forget about if you haven't been on a motorcycle for a few months. Uh, and, and also firearms. You know, there's a, a, a lot of free time in, in, uh, that, that, that folks have and a lot of temptation to, to take their pistols out, their shotguns out, and, and clean it or uh, disassemble it or load and unload it. I ask you, there's, there, there's no need to, to, uh, to be, be doing that particularly, uh, you know, uh, during, during this time. We don't have the medical resources to deal with, uh, with a gunshot wound when we're trying to focus on, on, uh, on, on 
the uh, COVID cases that, that are eventually going to be coming this way. Uh, and it also, we can't afford to lose a soldier to, uh, to negligence uh, from a, a, a negligent firearm discharge. So I just ask you to, uh, to look out for each other uh, and, uh, and uh, take care of each other as we, as we get through this crisis. All right. Well, great job, everyone. Thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, and uh, we'll try to do these as frequently as possible. Uh, and stay tuned in. Uh, we'll keep on posting material that we think is useful to you. And if you have any suggestions, please feel free to, to post and we will uh, do what we can. Thank you. Cool.